So our planet is under increasing amounts of pressure from uh, the growth in the human population, climate change, pollution, uh, the, the use of the oceans, the increasing pressure for food and for resources. And we need tools to understand the consequences of our actions on this planet. Now the climate modeling community has, for 50 or 60 years, created these tools called general circulation models, which are used to predict the consequences of uh, the release of CO2 and other greenhouse gases on the, on the planet's uh, climate. What we're trying to do here with the Mattingly model is to build an equivalent uh, type of model but for ecological systems. So to try and be able to understand the consequences of our actions on ecosystems at a global scale, so uh, both on land and in the oceans. Now climate models work by modeling very small scale fluid dynamics and from that you get emergent atmospheric patterns of circulation. What we're doing here is to do a, take a similar type of approach, is to model very small scale interactions among individuals and from that we get the emergent properties of ecosystems as a whole. So essentially we model uh, anything up to uh, hundreds or, or of thousands, millions, billions of individuals interacting in individual grid cells across the earth. Obviously this is a bit of a challenge computationally, so we, um, we do several things to deal with that. We combine individuals that have a similar ecological trajectory into a cohort, which is a group of similar organisms that interact in a similar way with their environment. And then these cohorts are the ones that are bumping into each other, that are feeding off one another, uh, that are growing, reproducing, dispersing, moving. So I'll show you uh, an example. This is the model running. I can show you the model running live. So this is, this is for a single grid cell, a terrestrial grid cell. So we spin up the model with uh, present day environmental characteristics. So present day uh, climate, climate, temperature, uh, amount of productivity, the plant material coming in. And every month we update the, the climate, etc. So what you'll see here is you'll see the time evolution of uh, four groups. So we have the autotrophs, the plants, which is the dark green line. We have omnivores, which is the blue line, herbivores, which is the light green, and carnivores, which, are the, uh, which is the red line. Now these patterns here are not prescribed, they're emerging dynamically from the interaction of individuals. And what you're seeing here is basically the, the biomass density, the amount of stuff per square kilometer. And as, as things eat one another, as, as the seasonal cycles happen, you can see that we get these responses among these different types of organisms. And each of these groups, so the carnivores may be made up of thousands of cohorts or tens of thousands of cohorts per grid cell of different types. So they could represent uh, lions if you're in a, um, a sort of a tropical system. Uh, they could represent bears and much smaller carnivores as well. All, all types of organisms from mice to, to, uh, to elephants and from plankton to whales. So we're trying to really cover the whole uh, ecosystem in terms of the types of organisms that are involved. Ultimately we'd like to model, you know, if we could, if we had infinite computational power, we'd like to model every single organism and uh, across the whole world. Clearly we can't do that, so that's why we've had to make these computational um, tweaks to be able to actually do this in a, in a finite amount of time. So this is evolving here, you can see, you can see things changing over uh, so this is a period of a year, so you can see things changing over a period of several years. But what we find is that we start the model with a very flat distribution of organisms, and over a period of time it settles down, and you get a, a sort of a, a steady state. Things oscillate, um, but you get a steady state. And then what, what we plan to do is perturb the steady state with human impacts. So with things like hunting, or pollution, or changing the climate, and see what consequences it has for the distribution of organisms in the ecosystem. So this is running the model at, at an individual grid cell level. What I'll show you now on our website is we have some uh, example videos of running the model at a global scale. So these, firstly I'm going to show you an example which is just looking at one ecological process which is dispersal in the oceans. So we see, t we, we see two locations with uh, individual ecological cohorts and then we just watch them as they flow across the oceans to see uh, how, how accurate our dispersal model is. And as you can see they're spreading out from those initial positions and uh, 
being dragged by the ocean circulation all around the world over a period of time. So this, this gives us confidence, we can do this, we can test ecological processes like reproduction or predation in isolation. And ultimately what, what we would like to do, and what, we're, what we have sort of made the first efforts at doing, is to look at the distribution of types of organisms and of, of body mass over the whole world. So here we have a map of um, biomass density where red is high, lots of stuff, and blue is low. So it, I'll run this video and if you notice we start, we seed the world with a flat biomass density so you have the same amount of stuff everywhere. But as, as time evolves we have different amounts of plant material supporting different numbers of animals, different types of animals and so you see these dynamic patterns emerging over time. You see real differences evolving. So what we would like to do is to continue to refine this model and make it into a useful policy tool by being able to make predictions for different uh, scenarios of human impact. Obviously this is a long-term project, so it's going to take a, a while to, to build up to that stage, but we hope to have something that's at least policy relevant uh, as soon as possible.